Hello! I wanted to break in here right at the beginning to let you know that while, to this point, our episode release schedule has been every other Friday morning, we're actually going to start releasing what we're begrudgingly titling CD Shorts on Off Fridays as well, which will literally just be a few minutes of straight reads of seed descriptions. No jokey-jokey funny stuff, just for anyone who's looking for closer to an ASMR experience, which is actually our original idea for this podcast. So certainly skip those if they're boring to you, and feel free to also rate them poorly and review them poorly on iTunes. Thanks, and on to the episode. Yeah, are you really feeling the the omission of your video game at this moment? Which I don't want to name yet. It's a teaser. It's been called the video game of the quarantine. Has it? I think, no, No, I think that's... uh... This is my gag. Oh. (laughs) <laughs> Wait, is this how you're going to start the episode with I don't this? know what I'm going to do. I don't know until the moment I edit it. But yeah, you got the shakes because <laughs> you're not playing your video <laughs> game right now. But let's let's soothe your tremors with a drink. Tell me what you're drinking, Allison. Drinking a Boulevardier. Can you describe what that is? Yeah, it's uh, like a Negroni, which people are very into right now. Though, whenever this comes out two weeks from now, who even knows? It'll be a new cocktail. Yeah. But instead of gin, it's with rye. Did you see there's a viral clip of character actor Stanley Tucci makes a sexy Negroni? I guess he, he sexily makes a Negroni. Yeah, I think that's the origin of... The current Negroni craze. So you're drinking some variant on a Negroni, some cultivar. Did I use that right? (laughs) It's CD business. It's CD business. Allison, what's in the garden? Well, we had raining. Yeah, it just started raining. We have the luxury of being able to say what is thriving in our garden right now, unlike much of the country in the throes of a polar vortex-induced snowstorm. On the online, I've been seeing lots of people covering their tender young gardens and hoping for the best, but here it's still 80 and sunny and just now has begun raining. Then let us cultivate our garden. It's the only way to make life endurable. Yeah, so we have green beans, which as a person raised in the Northeast, I classically think of as a July vegetable. Mm. But we've harvested our first green beans. We've had arugula and basil for a while now. We've got quite a lot of blossoms on our first melon vine. Gotta put up some sort of trellis for that melon. It desperately needs to be trellised. The amount of space it has is clearly insufficient. I put a picture of you harvesting green beans on the Instagram, but I did not gain your consent first, and now I'm realizing I should Wow, have. it has my face and everything. No, your face is fairly Just concealed. My hands. It's you, but you're not turned toward the camera. There are green beans in frame, though. All right. Well, now <laughs> people know we have them. So. And that we're people and not algorithms. Did you see that there's a pop star who's a computer program? That sounds familiar, but there's also there's they, also a famous model who mm-hmm. is a computer generated. So I might be thinking of that. They've been doing that for a while, I think, and even in other places besides the United States for longer. But the controversy this week is that they gave her a backstory which involved being sexually assaulted. Wow, that, that really she, seems unnecessary. Yeah, I hate it. Everyone hates it. <laughs> yeah, that it. sucks. It sucks real bad. Anyway, so we got green beans, and that's the new addition since last time is green beans. Yeah, I'm trying to think if there's anything else that's actually become harvestable, but I think that's it at this point. It's A lot of stuff needs to be transplanted because we're doing a lot of container gardening at this point. There's a lot of stuff that needs to go into a bigger pot or something. What's the long-term plan for the sandy soil situation? 
Well, I was going to, you know, the area that we cleared out that had a lot of weeds and vines and yeah. stuff, I think that is some actually viable soil. Mm. So I was going to mostly focus on planting climbers mm. in that area. That's sensible, yeah. Especially because it's going to be 90 degrees and sunny slash rainy pretty constantly, I guess, for a for number of months. six months, yeah. We can probably get a lot of cucumbers and stuff like that, watermelons. Hmm. Let them ramble across the <laughs> ground. <laughs> That'd be great if you couldn't walk in our backyard without stepping on a cucumber. Well, we now have a neighbor, so we have to at least courteous, contain yeah. our vegetables a little bit. Hmm. I hope we get to a point where our concern is containing our vegetables because they're so voluminous. Well, that's what happens when you plant squash, though. That's why people have that the classic zucchini problem. Mm. They really go out of control. All right. So the question, what's in the garden, has become fraught in recent days because it is not immediately clear if I'm asking you what is occurring in our garden in this reality, or if I am asking you about your in-game garden on the video game that you've been enjoying. Wow, are you, you're still teasing it? Well, it's the game of the quarantine. Incidentally, any question basically over the last week, what time is it? It's not clear if I'm referring to our Eastern daylight time or the time within this game. What are we eating? Well, I almost never <laughs> eat any food. <laughs> in game, in the game. Yeah. Yeah, so this game is, of course... Stardew Valley. Yes. Yeah, my primary food in Stardew Valley remains a compressed loaf of pine cones, acorns, <laughs> and maple seeds. <laughs> that sounds so nutritious and absolutely vile. Well, the thing is, the game rewards carrying a large number of the same item rather than a diversity of items mm. because you have a limited number of item slots. Sure. So I'd rather turn all of the useless pine cones into delicious. Wait a minute. Can you compress anything you own into a bar of food? Well, not that I know of. So during quarantine, you initially experimented with playing the game everyone else in the world is playing, which is Animal Crossing. Not the one everyone's playing, though, because I don't have a Switch or any gaming system. It was an iPhone version of Animal Crossing. Yeah, it was terrible. <laughs> you reject the basic premise that Animal Crossing is essentially the same game as Stardew Valley. I do. People keep saying that. Well, you especially keep saying that. <laughs> They're both farming simulators. There's pressure to give people gifts of your fruits and vegetables in both games, and they're rude to you if they don't want them in both games. I think in Animal Crossing, you don't really have a garden. You can cultivate fruit trees and flowers, but I don't think you grow vegetables. But you have turnips. I know turnips is a currency. In Animal Crossing? In Animal Crossing, yeah. Is there currency in Stardew Valley? It's like a classic RPG. It's gold. Hmm, okay. Yeah. Here's what I know about your life in Stardew Valley thus far. You have a deep platonic friendship with Linus the Wild Man. Yeah, he's my best friend. He's your best friend. You share gifts with one another? Yeah. And he appreciates your gifts. That's right. What gifts have you given that have not been appreciated by others? There's a lack of logic to some extent in which people like which items. But if you give someone something they don't like, some of them are sort of polite about it. They'll be like, oh, well, I guess everyone has different tastes or, oh, OK, I'll just put this over here. But other people will say, why are you giving me this actual garbage? <laughs> My mom taught me to never respond to someone who's giving me a gift by calling their gift actual garbage. Wow, she explicitly <laughs> told you not to do that? Pretty much. Mm. So after I played my first two in-game years... Oh, well, that's this is dangerous because someone could look up exactly how long it takes to complete two in-game years. Well, 
my point is that's the point when I started looking online at information about the game and its world, where I learned that I had really made a bunch of critical errors and could have done all sorts of things differently. But well, the- you're... Your late grandfather is disappointed in the state of your garden? It's a farm. It's not a garden. Okay. But yeah, I didn't do as well as he would have liked. (laughs) What are your crops? But hold on. Mm. There's one thing that I did avoid that I'm really happy with, which is that if you give Linus a gift he doesn't like, he says, just because I don't have a home, you think I should eat garbage? And I'm really glad that never happened to me because I think I would have quit playing the game. Oh, Linus lives in a cave. No, he lives in a tent right next to a cave that he could <laughs> be living in. Oh, well, he chooses a tent over a perfectly good pre-existing cave? Yeah, that's right. Well, I don't understand that. Um, Me neither, to be honest. Anyway, in terms of this podcast, what are your crops? What's in the garden? Well, it's currently winter in Stardew Valley for mm. me. And I actually have a greenhouse now which is not something you start with. Can you grow all year round? Yeah, so I don't have anything growing in the outdoor garden, and I have exclusively perennials in the greenhouse at this point, so I never have to plant anything. Mm. Unless I specifically want to grow something, then I guess I'd have to cut something down. My understanding is if you get married in-game, your spouse will perform all of your farming tasks for you. Yeah, I guess if you get married, your spouse will do all of the watering of crops, the feeding of animals, and repairing of fences. Mm. So they'll do kind of all of the boring, most stuff. It's really incentivized, yeah. (laughs) Yeah. I'm not married. So you have to do all this work yourself. You have complained about the amount of work that you've had to do in this game. I remain sick of the amount of management of objects I have to do. That feels like real work. That (laughs) feels like real world work. And I sometimes feel like the way I feel when I go into our garage, which is why do I have all this stuff? I Mm. hate this. (laughs) I stopped playing because of the frequency with which I had to refill my watering can. Do you have irrigation or something? I now have sprinklers. So. I only grow the amount of crops that I can afford sprinklers such that I never have to water anything. Mm. That's at this point, I'm I'm never watering anything again. <laughs> I think it's easy. The problem is I think it's better on the computer. In the mobile version, there are a lot of sort of glitches. So you can upgrade your tools. Mm. And at some point, I guess the watering can at least on the computer version, you can water a bunch of squares at once Mm. with the upgrade, but I can't actually figure out what gesture on the mobile version will let me water a bunch of squares at once. Mm. So the upgrades have not proven worth it. Sprinklers would be great. I will say that St. John's County recently advised that we might want to use sprinklers to water our lawn here. Well, lest we not have a green, green lawn, lawn yeah. here it's on the beach. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, I only grow perennial crops in my greenhouse, and that includes, well, these wouldn't necessarily be perennial, but in this world they are, uh, hops, coffee, peppers, tomatoes, grapes, green beans. <laughs> this is a real random assortment of things that normally would not be grown together. Cranberries, Mm. blueberries, strawberries. I think my main economic activity is making blueberry wine and jelly. Wow, that sounds great. When I've watched you eat on this game, you will take out one of these things that you've grown, toss it into the air, and then munch it on the way down. It's a chomp. You jump and chomp. It's sort of a <laughs> classic 8-bit eating gesture, I think. Mm. Are you considering marriage to have a servant? The idea that a spouse is an automaton <laughs> who will do all of your unpleasant tasks for you Thanklessly. Mm. Uh, I mean, it's not exactly thankless. You have to give them gifts even after they marry you. Mm. Most, I, It seems like most people 
give their spouse like a diamond every day or something. <laughs> but a diamond <laughs> is worth the same amount as a strawberry or something you said in this game? Under certain circumstances, but in terms of like just selling it on the open market a diamond is worth less than half a dozen eggs. Mm -hmm. I like this. Yeah. That makes sense, I think, to me. Um, I'm interested in talking about soup making. Real soup making? What are you talking about? Well. <laughs> oh, the luau. <laughs> this is, uh, yeah, the luau. Right. In Stardew Valley, there's a, an event, a luau, where everyone, they have a, what they call a potluck. And by that, they mean not that everyone brings a prepared dish, but that there's a huge communal vat and everyone tosses whatever they want into the vat. And then that becomes the soup that it's a everyone literal eats. trough. Yeah. And you have to scale the steps. It's so big, you have to climb steps to get to the top and dump in whatever you've brought. And then based on the quality of what you put in the soup, they tell you whether the soup was the best soup they've ever had, mediocre, or terrible. <laughs> My first year, I brought seaweed because that's what I would put did in soup. Did you grow seaweed? No. How I, did you access seaweed? I got it fishing. Oh, okay. But that's what I would put in a soup in the real world. Mm. That goes with anything. You can combine it with almost any savory soup ingredient and seaweed will make it better. So I put that in the soup. The soup was terrible. I'm very excited about the catalog that we're looking at today. It's blown the idea of seed catalogs wide open for me. I didn't realize that they could be delivered in this style and tone. I advise that everyone pick up a copy of this. Like I have ordered a hard copy. We're looking at the PDF at the moment, uh, but it is so charming. And it's the first time that I've read a seed catalog and thought, oh, the people who compiled this, I could know these people or I could be friends with these people. I think you could know the people at Strictly Medicinal. <laughs> or high mowing. High mowing. High mowing, sure. yeah. Uh, but this is the Fedco catalog. The Fedco Seeds and Supplies catalog. It's their 2020 catalog. Listen, until I tell you otherwise, if I mention a 2020 catalog, it's from the before times. I don't know if there'll ever be a catalog again. We'll have to wait and see. But this is Fedco Seeds and Supplies, their 2020 catalog. So it actually reminds me most of Strictly Medicinal. I think that's the most obvious corollary in that there are tons of beautiful like line drawings of fruits and vegetables and also like tiny characters. It was gnomes in in uh, Strictly Medicinal here. These are also gnomes. I are they say. gnomes? Yeah. I mean, they're wearing pointed cat. Well, I was going to say they're elvish, perhaps. Well, I guess it depends on what flavor of elf versus gnome you're working with in mm. your personal mythology. But I think teeny tiny underground people with pointy hats <laughs> is gnomes or fairies fair enough more than elves but it but there are flavors of elf that mm. more resemble that on the cover there are a series of these creatures holding banners some of which say free the seed keep our soils alive we support seed savers rights which i think is a very interesting banner this style of seed catalog and the people who make it, I really think that Seed Savers is a patron saint for them. Well, seed saving is a, an activity. Sure, but I, th as we'll read about in a moment, they're part of the open source seed movement yeah. that has been pioneered in the biggest way by the Seed Savers brand. Mm. 
Um, so I wonder if that's a sort of a reference to that. There's also a banner that says Seed Sovereignty. It's a sovereign seed gnome. Uh, one of them is is wearing a coat that says it's a MAGA coat, Make America Garden Again. I think that is a, a gag that worked better in 2017 than it does now. <laughs> it's a little depressing. <laughs> one of them has a, a handheld projector, and it's projecting an enormous image of a pumpkin against a wall. But the pumpkin is like hyper-realistically and beautifully drawn compared to them who are cartoony. It's a great cover. It's beautiful. Yeah, it's beautiful pen drawing. Mm. These characters exist throughout. The revolutionary messaging on the cover is also carried throughout. On the second page, there's a fist clenching a beat. It's a revolutionary fist in the air, but it's holding a beat, which I think is pretty great. Also beautifully drawn. Whoever does their illustrations is doing a great job. Mm. Have you looked at the illustration at the bottom of the third page? Not to continue this highly visual conversation, <laughs> but there's a woman in a very like witchy outfit mm. with a wide-brimmed hat at a cool angle mm -hmm. and an asymmetric floral print dr dress. It goes up to her uh, neck. It's like a turtleneck, and mm -hmm. then she's got but it's cut off at the knees and then she's got knee socks and pointy shoes with flowers. Anyway, she's wielding a pitchfork. Yeah. It's very cool and witchy. I mean, I really recommend that anyone pick up a copy of this and flip through it. There's at one point, uh, one page, there's a little girl on a tree swing, but the tree is an enormous head of broccoli. In the corn section, there's a corn called Nirvana. And well, why don't you just read Nirvana? Just do it. Okay. This is one of their super sweet corns. Nirvana, super sweet F1 hybrid. We've been saying never mind to super sweet corn for ages. The early years of SH2 breeding never came close to capturing the flavor and tenderness we demand. But a select few progressive super sweets brought balanced excellence to our attention in our central main trials. At your first bite into the crisp but tender kernels, Nirvana's wash of full corn flavor hits and persists. The bold SH2 sweetness and perfect flavor swirl, neither submerging nor melding. Come as you are to this super sweet experience with all your judgments and preconceptions. Holding quality in the field and after harvest is superb. Never direct seed a super sweet until soil temps exceed 65 degrees. And then as you might expect from those not at all subtle references, uh, this is depicted by Kurt Cobain strumming an enormous corn on the cob as though it were a guitar. So I think this is, I mean, beyond it being cute and surprisingly hip, that's really well written too. Yeah, I think that's great. It's fun. The illustration is very fun as well. Mm -hmm. And beyond, I'll, I'll go one step further, beyond it being fun and hip and well-written, the heading of this section, the section of super sweet corns, has an ideology that we can really get behind. I'm going to read that too. For decades, Fedco has been a firm proponent of eating quality in sweet corn, with flavor, texture, and kernel depth as our in-house metrics. We're a corny flavor bunch, dismissing sweetness as the sole measure of breeding progress. Until recently, we hadn't encountered eating excellence in a super sweet variety. Breeders have now balanced the extra sweetness with tenderness, creaminess, and full flavor. In a lot of catalogs, when they get to their super sweet corns, they'll just fucking go hard at how sweet they are and assume that's what you want. Here, they are acknowledging that that comes at an expense. Yeah, and that it has to be balanced with other aspects of the flavor and texture and quality. Mm. So as you might have caught earlier, this catalog is out of Maine. Did we, we say that? We It was referenced okay. earlier. We've had a, a string of catalogs that are places uh, in the, the West Coast or especially in, the, in Arcadia 
this is maybe our first New England catalog. Yeah, this might be the first mm-hmm. New England. I mean, we have a lot of catalogs that are sort of national also, but this one is is New England. I looked up the hardiness bands for Maine, and they exist in, in zones three through six. Hmm. And in particular, this is a catalog out of Clifton, Maine, which is in zone four. And I was thinking, man, what grows well in zone four? We should read some of those. So I was thinking maybe we'd start with leeks. Sure. So it's divided into summer leeks, autumn leeks, and winter leeks. So I'm going to start with the summer leek, King Richard. This distinctive, refined, early leek once again rules supreme, reselected and brought back to its elegant form with upright shanks a foot long to the first medium green leaves. Ready in late August and can withstand light frosts, but should be harvested before those heavily frosted nights in late October. But I'd also like to read Lincoln, which is another summer leek. A leek with a dual purpose, Lincoln may be sown thickly like scallions, harvested in 50 to 60 days, and bunched for upscale direct markets and discerning chefs. Or transplanted more conventionally, they may be allowed to grow another three weeks to full size. Shanks even longer and sleeker than King Richard's, with delicate, sweet leek flavor. Ready in late August, will withstand light frosts, but should be harvested before late October. Boy, this is making me, you make a delicious potato leek soup Mm. that we haven't had in a while because it's perpetually summer now. So the stores around here don't seem to sell beets or leeks or any of the things that I would think of as cooler season vegetables, Mm. which doesn't really make sense because the grocery store is part of the global food system. I don't know why they wouldn't have beets or something down here. It doesn't really make sense. Certainly Publix is not getting local produce. Right, yeah. I'm going to read one of the winter leeks, which is the Siegfried Frost. Making much of its growth below ground, where it is protected from the cold, This leek often withstands the rigors of winter to offer a delectable spring treat. With stalks growing as much as four inches across, there is plenty to enjoy. Most will survive winters with good snow cover if you hill your leeks and mulch after the ground freezes. Open winters with fluctuating temperatures and multiple freezes and thaws are the enemy you must overcome. It's really well written. It really is. Yeah, it's a great piece of copy, I think. I want to know who my enemy is when I'm gardening. Everybody needs an antagonist to do their best work. Is there also a correlation between, like these are particularly thick. Do thicker things survive winter better? I've never grown leeks. Mm. I don't know that there's a... I don't know that there's a thickness to (laughs) cold hardiness correlation. I don't know. Obviously, if something is very thin, it can freeze through real quick. Well, that's true. I guess I don't know a lot about the effects of thermal mass. The thing is, though, we're talking about ground freezing for a while, right? Snow and all that. Yeah. So I think for plants, it's more about whether they can produce the compounds that prevent ice crystals from forming and damaging the tissue than about thermal mass because Mm. ultimately like the amount of mass in a small leak and a very big leak are probably not so different as to make too much of a difference over the course of a winter. I mean. All right. Give me another one. Well, I was going to read the hybrid of the King Richard Mm. and the Siegfried Frost, which you read. Mm -hmm. And that's called, of course, King Zig. Beth Rogorshek of Canyon Bounty in Idaho crossed King Richard with Siegfried Frost to create a versatile, stable cultivar that has some of the good attributes of both. Zig appears to have inherited the most from Siegfried. Its shanks are intermediate between the long King Richard and the short Siegfried, about six inches long. 
but with a wonderful three-inch thickness for a wide edible area. It also has some of Siegfried's delightful blue-green coloration and delayed maturity. And that's OSSI certified. Yeah, I don't know if we've talked about this before. They have a blurb in here about OSSI, the Open Source Seed Initiative. Uh, Apparently, they are among 66 seed companies that are partners of the Open Source Seed Initiative, which they describe as an effort by a consortium of seed folks, farmer breeders, academics, and others to keep as many seed varieties as possible in the public domain. They also list the, quote, four seed freedoms. OSSI opposes intellectual property provisions that restrict what OSSI has identified as the four seed freedoms. Number one, the freedom to save or grow seed for replanting or any other purpose. Number two, the freedom to share, trade, or sell seed to others. Number three, the freedom to trial and study seed and to share or publish information about it. And number four, the freedom to select or adapt the seed, make crosses with it, or use it to breed new lines and varieties. And Fedco carries 43 of these varieties at the moment. And every buyer of these seeds has to uphold the following open source agreement. (laughs) You have the freedom to use these OSSI pledged seeds in any way you choose. In return, you pledge to not restrict others' use of these seeds or their derivatives by patents or or other means, and to include this pledge with any transfer of these seeds or their derivatives. Yeah, it's a very, it's a Creative Commons license. Yeah, I love it. Model for seed breeders. I really like the idea that if you get some of these seeds and give some to your friend, you have to make them take this pledge also. (laughs) Incidentally, it's worth mentioning that on the same pages they describe the Open Source Seed Initiative, they also have a section where they talk about how they pay royalties on a number of their seeds, on 14 varieties in particular, to local indigenous peoples in Maine. Yeah, so OSSI doesn't certify indigenous and ancient varieties. Mm Mm-hmm. Because there's no one person who owns it sure. or who made it who can say, I would like to have this, have the sort of an open source license agreement. Mm-hmm. The other particularly cold, hardy vegetable that I was thinking I mean, we might be able to read some descriptions for is chard. So chard and beets are basically the same plant, but chard is bred to have dramatic big leaves and beets are bred to have dramatic big roots. I absolutely didn't know that. Does chard have shitty little beets? You know, I guess I've never pulled up a chard plant to see if the roots form any sort of a bulb. Hmm. So I don't know the answer, but their seeds look pretty much exactly alike. Hmm. I was hoping to do cranberries, but I don't think they sell. I'm not sure. Nobody grows cranberry from seed. Yeah. And it's not, it doesn't seem like it's madness. It doesn't seem like the kind of thing that like an amateur grower can easily, you need a bog. Is that right? I don't know if that's true. I mean, cranberries, I think you can grow in non-bog situations. I think the reason they're grown in bogs, I could be wrong about this. I think it's a harvesting mechanism. You flood the field that they're Mm. growing in, and then all the ripe berries come off of the bushes and float to the top, and then you scoop them off the top of the water. You also don't want to destroy the natural habitat of bog monsters. Well, that's true. But similar to beets and chard, I think, I shouldn't say this because I actually don't know. I I was going to say, I think cranberries and blueberries are basically (gasps) the same. That's shocking. I mean, not exactly. They're They're more different than than beets and chard, but I think they might be in the same family. Wow. Yeah, so I just fact-checked myself. And indeed, vaccinium is a common and widespread genus of shrubs in the heath family, Ericaceae. The fruits of many species are eaten by humans, 
and some were of commercial importance, including the cranberry, blueberry, bilberry, lingonberry, and huckleberry. So I'm right that blueberries and cranberries are in the same family and actually same genus. Huh. They're pretty closely related. How different are things? What are we in the same genus as? Oh my god. Well, nothing that's extant. Really? It's just us? Yeah. Huh. We killed and ate all the rest. (laughs) (laughs) So we have nothing as closely related to us as cranberries are to blueberries? Well, I don't know about that because then you're getting into a question of... What constitutes a genus? Well, even more than that divergence time versus what people have decided should be called a genus. I mean, to some extent, the idea of a genus or a family is arbitrary. Right. And whether things are in the same genus that are separated by a couple million years or much more than that is really variable across the tree of life. And it does certainly doesn't correlate with, with what we would instinctively and visually see as similar or dissimilar. Well, for example... What correlates, but For example, there are lots of sea urchins that are in the same genus, but are diverged by, say, tens of millions of years, whereas I think humans and chimpanzees are just a few million years diverged. Mm -hmm. So there's at least an order of magnitude difference there. Sure. But on its face, a cranberry and a blueberry are more closely related than we are to great apes or something. Well, we are great apes, and I don't know. (laughs) Speak for yourself. I don't even know what, I don't know what's true anymore. (laughs) I don't even know if that's true, what I just said. Well, that's when science is at its best, when it devolves into not knowing what's true anymore. But the reason why you get all sorts of pluots and plum cots and apriums <laughs> and whatnot is all of those stone fruits are basically the same I see. plant. Mm-hmm. Plums and peaches and apricots are and almonds are all very, very similar. Mm-hmm. Oh, I think beets and chard are the same species, not just same genus. Wow. On the same page as Chard, in the chicory section, there's a cartoon of a chef in a dramatic apron flipping enormous chicory in a frying pan, I think. I guess maybe he's a gnome. He's a human, but he has a gnome hat on. I think there's more than one artist who's drawn Mm. the illustrations for this catalog, so I'm not sure that there's any intention that they're (laughs) thematically linked. I think that's right. Let's read some chart. Go ahead. Let me read the Perpetual Spinach, which is a great name. The Perpetual Spinach is also known as Leaf Beet. Thanks to Pam Dolling for suggesting we add this member of the chard family. Leaf beet should be cultured like any other chard variety. It looks similar to other Swiss chards, but its stems are thinner, and its exceptionally tender leaves are smoother, not puckered. It tastes unlike any other chard, imparting a spinach-like flavor that lingers pleasantly. Unlike spinach, perpetual lasts through summer into fall as it withstands light and moderate frosts. Production from June to October, reports one central Vermont grower. Wow, that sounds great. It does. I like that they reference individual growers as authority figures. Also, this is another case of one plant, its name being another plant. (laughs) Perpetual spinach. Yeah, true. It's like an everlasting gobstopper, except Except a kid really doesn't want to eat it. It's like the inverse of a actual <laughs> gobstopper. Well, I will read the variety of chard, the only, I think, only variety of chard I've ever planted, which is Bright Lights. Mm. Bright Lights, a bestseller and 1998 AAS winner from Johnny's Selected Seeds. Bright Lights bathe stems, midribs, and secondary veins in a panoply of gold, yellow, orange, pink, intermediate pastels, and dazzling stripes. The tenderness of its dark green to bronze leaves and the mildness of its charred flavor impresses all who try it. 
Young seedlings respond to cut-and-come-again culture, ideal for mesclun. Developed by John Eaton of Lower Hutt, New Zealand, who found the parent plants, red and yellow, in a small home garden in 1977 and crossed them to standard green and white varieties, selecting for color and flavor over the next 15 years. Johnny's worked the following years to preserve the strength and range of the individual colors. They really give credit to individuals in this catalog. Yeah, I mean, there's a clear interest in the history of the seed. Yeah, real labor of love by John Eaton. 15-year journey. I'm going to read Bali. Bali chard is a spectrum leap from traditional rhubarb chard, even at baby stage. It's like putting little red lightning bolts in your salad mix. With a very dark, lush green, fully savoyed leaf, the veins and stalk contrast like fiery lava. Mouthfeel is juicy and succulent, flavor very mild. No odd bolting or wilting. No beet-rooted rejects or wiggly weird stems. Excellent regrowth for multiple harvests. This is red charred perfection from Bejo Seeds. I'm going to say it right now. This is my favorite catalog I've ever read. Yeah, this is great. So, but the thing I was going to say, I thought you were about to burst in on this, <laughs> is so the idea that having a beet like root is bad if it's charred yeah. appears, that appears to be sort of a breed standard. Mm-hmm. Interesting. You want to know that it's really been bred for the leaves and not any other part. Is it possible to have the best of both worlds? Well, that sounds like a lifetime project for you. (laughs) Can you grow? Should I spend the rest of my life trying to grow a beet that has good leaves and a good bulb? Yeah, leaves, a beet with leaves as good as any chard. I just love this. It's very beautiful. The illustration of cauliflower is really blowing my mind right now. (laughs) Well, they have a... Absolutely wide variety of beets, too. What a good selection. To connect to what we were just talking about, I'm interested in starting with Bull's Blood, which reads, Prized for its spectacular leaves, not its rough, flattened, globe-shaped roots. Runaway winner of the 26 varieties in our Beet Greens trial years back. Sweet and nutty, with never a hint of oxalic aftertaste. It again received high praise from our tasters more recently. Also a winner in appearance with large glossy reddish purple leaves. No bull. It holds quality all summer, with color intensifying as it grows, especially under cool conditions in fall or under winter cover. Bull's blood is Elliot Coleman's red leaf of choice for winter harvest salad mixes. Old variety. Its name hints of 19th century origins when beets were known as blood turnips. Selected around 1840 from the French variety Cropaldine for darkest colored leaves. So this one's prized for its leaves. Interesting. Yeah, I was not aware that there were beets specifically prized for their leaves. I guess I thought if it had great leaves, then pretty much it was charred. charred. Yeah. Yeah. So I wonder, has anyone crossed bull's blood with a particularly prized root? Is anyone trying to really, (laughs) really really split that baby? (laughs) (laughs) As you've proposed, as I think I'll hold you to, as your new main life's mission (laughs) is breeding the perfect leaf root balanced beet. It's a noble life's purpose, definitely. Oh, actually, let me read the description of kestrel. Kestrel, which grows in 23 to 35 days if you are harvesting baby or 55 days for full size. It's an F1 hybrid. Newly released veggie varieties are often touted for their dual purpose potential but much of this verbiage falls flat in our hardy main trial program. Kestrel beet is an exception, meeting and possibly exceeding the quality of elder sibling red ace. In the early baby and summer crop, vigorous healthy greens top 
elegant, uniform, heart-shaped roots. The tender, deep red interior was mild and sweet, even after 2018's dry, scorching June. Come fall, full-size, rounded heart roots develop sweet, full flavor with zero bitter sharpness. Triple happiness is complete when Kestrel emerges from long storage, firm and yummy. After other beet varieties have wrinkled or rotted, Kestrel is now perched in our beet-like hearts. That's so terrific. So that's, if you want an all-around beet, it looks like you should try yeah, Kestrel. You could do worse. I wonder if you'll see more and more in descriptions. Remember this season when the weather was absolutely bonkers? Well, this plant still grew well, even during that drought or whatever. Like in this one, it's saying this one did well, even during 2018's dry, scorching June. As we continue to have weather disaster after weather disaster, I wonder if it will be a way to advertise how resistant a plant is to say when everything else was on fire in 2020, this one made it through. But don't you see it's cold right now in parts of the Northeast United States. So that means that yeah, global climate change isn't happening. Well, I'll tell Somehow you what means, means that-, that global climate change isn't happening. The fact that there's a viral pandemic happening Because only one thing can happen at once. Well, that's true, yeah. There can only be one thing. Yeah. Well, it's going to be a rude awakening someday when this is over and everyone with great relief can take a deep breath and realize that the world is on fire again. But there's uh, there's some psychological research that suggests people literally can't come to grips with the idea of a global climate change because Mm. it's too big and scary of a problem. And I actually wonder if a global pandemic might help people's brains adapt to the idea of there being a big, scary problem (laughs) that we have to do something about. Well, we'll have exhausted all our resources to do something about it, even if we wanted to do something about it. Well, I don't know if you should include that pessimistic statement. We're done for, is all I'm saying. Well, humans as a species probably aren't because of their wide distribution Hmm. over the globe, but... I'm personally done for. Agree or disagree? Well, that's... At this point, that's a choice. (laughs) I'm not saying it always will be, but currently that would be a choice. Do you want to end with an online review? Yes, please. (laughs) Okay. As you might expect, if you go to the Fedco website, they they don't fucking let you write reviews of their seeds. That's trashy. Only trashy companies let you write reviews of their seeds. I wanted to find a chard that had some customer reviews for it. This Swiss chard on the Burpee site is the Neon Lights Blend. I'll read you the description. Oh, God, this writing. It's a real fucking, it's a real punch in the face to read this after what we have just been reading. I guarantee you the way Burpee copy is written, the incentives are like, generate a large number of words per hour worked. Yeah, we're paying you hourly, copywriter, and... It is not about the quality, but about the quantity. Yeah, some real whiplash here. The Swiss chard neon lights blend. Neon lights is the most beautiful rainbow chard you can grow. It's better than bright lights. (laughs) Brilliant, dazzling colors with no intermediate tones. We've blended four varieties, 25% each. Intense red bright orange, hot pink, and sunny yellow. Sew together in rainbow rows or transplant to group separate colors together. 
The leaves of all are bright green, excellent in salads, when young or cooked any way that you would use spinach. So in early spring and again in midsummer for a fall and winter crop. Neon lights is the most beautiful chard you can grow. It's better than bright lights, which presumably is something they also sell but are shitting on. I don't know. Do the, Check the burpee catalog. See if they sell bright lights. Yeah, they absolutely sell bright lights. All right. Incidentally, their claim that it's better than bright lights is ridiculous. Bright lights chard has a 4.8. 11 out of 11 reviewers would recommend bright lights Swiss chard. On the other hand, folks had some problems with the neon lights blend. Well, wait, let me guess. Because it's a blend, the different colors actually require slightly different care or have different qualities. So some of them taste better than others and some of them thrive while others do not in a particular climate. Are those the kinds of complaints people have? It's directly related to the fact that it's a blend and therefore they're uneven? It, it's hard to say. I will say that... I'm going to read you one. Bonnie 04 from Fayetteville, Arkansas says in her two-star review... No neon. Well, all right. (laughs) I can see immediately. (laughs) I planted my first package of neon Swiss chard in my greenhouse three weeks ago and got four plants. Sad emoticon. On the other hand, I think every single beet and bib lettuce must have come up. I want the neon Swiss chard so much that I'm going to plant a second pack of seeds this week. So Burpees really got Bonnie 04 by the, what's the way to say it that's not by the balls? By the collar? By the collar. Got Bonnie 04 by the collar here. Every time she doesn't get neon Swiss chard, she's going to plant more neon Swiss chard because she wants it so bad. Well, they told her it was better than bright lights. So, I mean, what what is she to do? Plant (laughs) bright lights? (laughs) Yeah, that's out of the question. Because there's no way neon lights is more neon than bright lights. Yeah, I mean, no way. It's just less varied. There are only four colors instead of various intermediate tones. Mm-hmm. The picture that they offer for bright lights, by the way, looks beautiful. And that even the picture of neon lights looks like shit. So I don't know why it's appealing to people besides their claim that it's better than bright lights. It's probably more expensive than bright lights. Well, is it? 200 seeds for 540. Yes, it's more expensive than bright lights. All right, so that's why it's better then. (laughs) It's definitely better for them. Mm. Miss Pern from Long Island, New York, wrote a five-star review saying, Neon Lights is great. I've grown it for three years and have always been satisfied. Yes, slugs can be a problem. Try setting out cheap beer in trays, and the slugs will go for it and drown in it too! Exclamation point. Don't let slugs stop you. (laughs) That's a good moral lesson. Don't let slugs stop you is a great motto to live by. (laughs) The no neon exclamation point reminds me of some of the other reviews we've read where the product they're selling has one and no more than one selling point. Like the big corn, where some of the reviews were like, it's not big. It's not all that big. The only thing that it is being marketed for, it is not. Or the seedless tomato that's not entirely that seeds. seedless. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Though, to be fair, the definition of a seedless variety, I guess, is not. I learned this recently, I think, since we recorded that episode, is not that it does not have any seeds, but that it does not have mature seeds that form a coat. So the way that seedless watermelons have those ghostly, white, tiny, shrunken seeds, as long as an actual seed coat is not applied, then seed companies count that as seedless. Okay. On a technicality. So I don't know whether the tomatoes these people were complaining about had immature uncoated seeds or not. I see. Anyway, the Neon Lights Blend, 3.4 out of 5 stars. Middling, a middling Swiss chard, I think we can all agree. 
Oh, I should mention, this is important. In Stardew Valley, beets are a, <laughs> beets are a rare seed that you only unlock after some amount of time. They're a specialty seed. Can you, is Stardew Valley the kind of thing where they make you play it for so many hours before you can get beets, but if you're willing to pay them real American currency, they'll let you have beets right away. Can you buy beets with real money? No, there's no in-game purchases. Okay. So they really make you work for beets. I mean, I don't think I knew beets even existed in the world until I'd been like quite a ways into the game. How much is a beet worth compared to a half dozen eggs or a diamond? I actually don't even know. <laughs> I've grown very few beets so far. Have you grown more beets in real life or in Stardew Valley? Real life for sure. Wow. But I've grown more turnips in Stardew Valley. Maybe that's why you think it's the same as Animal Crossing. Because of turnips? Yeah. Because turnips are the first crop you grow in Stardew Valley. Really? Yeah. Your starting package includes a bunch of turnip seeds. Who gives them to you? I don't know. You Your late grandfather. recently played the beginning of the game. I think they're just like, welcome to town. Here, Here are-, are your turnip seeds. Yeah. Every citizen is assigned <laughs> turnip seeds. Well, they are the spring crop. You start in the spring and they're the spring crop that grows the fastest. Mm. So I think the idea is they're giving you- Seeds that will produce a sellable product within a few days to start you out. What did we learn earlier when we were reading beet descriptions that initially people called them like blood turnips? People used to call them blood turnips. That's what. Wow, that's so nasty. Well, if you think of blood as delicious, then it's <laughs> good. Okay, well, you can find us at CD Business on Twitter, CD Business Pod on Instagram. You can email us at cdbusinesspod at gmail.com. Rate us poorly and review us poorly on iTunes. And as I mentioned at the beginning of this episode, look for off-Friday releases of CD Shorts, which are just a few minutes of straight reads of seed descriptions. If you are into that kind of thing, eat your blood turnips. And in general, eat your vegetables. We're all just doing the best we can. Speak for yourself. It's CD Business. It's CD Business. Boring talk about seed, CD talk between balls. Time to make chatter about onions and spores. We'll dig a ditch and we'll moan and spit the difference. It's CD Business.